Welcome to church, everybody. We're so glad you could join us today because today we're talking about what it means to fuel a warm community. You see, we do want to be much more than a broadcast, much more than someone you check into once a week. We want to be a family. We want to grow a community and build relationships that are centered on Jesus and help us to be more than just acquaintances. We want to be family. And so I'm just glad you could be a part of today's broadcast and just know that today we want to see what it means to make you more family. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a
So I just want to take a moment to tell you about some exciting things that are happening in the life of this church. And whether you're here locally or around the world, you can be involved this holiday season. And so I want to first tell you about our upcoming town hall meetings. This coming Wednesday, November 18th, and then again on Saturday, November 21st, we are just going to have an open dialogue Q&A, and we want to let you know about the future of this church. We want to get your input. We want to hear from you. We want to be able to discuss what's important to you because this is your church. And so please join us for these town hall meetings. You can just go to the site that's listed below and you can get the invitation. And we want you to be a part of what it means to be a church family. Secondly, I want to tell you about our turkey drive. This is kind of an exciting opportunity we have to partner with one of our ministry partnerships, City Team Ministries in Oakland. They have a men's uh, recovery center. They also serve to the homeless food and give them clothes uh, every day of the week. And so at Thanksgiving, they have a special name because there are a lot of people without a home. And last year we provided um, over 100 turkeys for them to serve the thousands of people that are being served. And so you can right now buy a turkey which feeds several people. And all you have to do is go to this link right now. And then when you order turkey, you need to know that you are helping a family who otherwise wouldn't even have a home cooked meal to receive a pretty special day. And so just so you know with that, our goal is to raise at least $1,500. So far we've raised about $1,000. Let's get over the top. Lastly, I wanna tell you about one of my favorite ministries. It's called California Reentry Institute. Colette Carroll's a good friend and the work that she does with her team at San Quentin Prison to help men get back into society is remarkable. The recidivism rate is zero. In other words, those who come out of prison over 50%, probably more like 80%, go right back into the system, go right back into prison. And so through her program, these men are able to get jobs, they're able to get housing, they're able to get clothing and, and a fresh start. And, and so for us as a church, we've said we want to partner with this ministry because it is vital. And so they are going to have their first ever online auction, November 19th through 21st. And if you want to just go to the link that you see on your screen right now, you can register for that auction. And I hope you participate because this is a wonderful ministry. If you want to know more, go to CaliforniaReentryInstitute.org or CRI.org to find out more. And lastly, I want to let you know that because of you and your giving and your generosity, this church is continuing to thrive. And because you are giving, we are able to have these broadcasts on a regular basis. Now that's not a given. Like everyone else, our resources are very tight. But we just know that this is our family, this is our home. And so we want to invest in that and we hope that you see this as your home as well. We want you to go from viewership to ownership because that's what it means to be a part of a family. Not just spectators, but participants. Because why? Because this is home. And we want our home to thrive. And we want to be able to do some of these incredible ministries you just heard about all the more and get all the more involved. And so I hope that you would just join us in our offering today. I hope that you would give to the ministry of this church. And I just want to pray for that right now. And so Lord Jesus, I just pray for everyone who's listening today that they would want to be more than just viewers, but owners, that this would be home, that this would be a community they want to invest in because they see that what's happening here is that you are being glorified and lives are being changed. And a lot of that is because of the resources that we are able to use for your glory. So whether it's a California Reentry Institute or a City Team Ministries or a, um, just having these broadcasts, Lord, I, I just pray now that you would just help us to just think beyond our normal uh, pace of life and stop and take a moment and invest in your kingdom work. So Lord, thank you, not only for the gift, but for the givers. Lord, thank you for these people who share not just their prayers, their time, but their resources so that you might become known and more can know and have the hope of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Drink from, oh, is mine.
like if people know my name, I'm in a warm community. If I walk into a church and it's my 10th time visiting and people are still like, hi, welcome to this church that you've never been to before in your life. Then it's like, all right, time to move on to somewhere else that will acknowledge me a little more. That's a good one. Yeah. Like, welcome, you're a new face. And you're like, no, no, Deborah. Been here for a while. <laughs> Coming for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I think in that, that same vein as Drew, um, I think it's very, I, I don't know how to describe it or how to fix it. Like, so, but I'm just going to talk through it. Um, like when there's cliques or like very clear groups that exist, like, and you can walk into, well, back when we, you know, move, like actually went into places, but like walk into the sanctuary or whatever. And people just like look to see that you're in there, but they don't initiate or whatever. As a new person, that can be really intimidating to just see someone not acknowledge you or welcome you, but also as someone who might have been in the church for a while to know that there is still some mm, like coldness. Okay. So opposite of warmth, but <laughs> like, uh, like there's still not engagement. Like, you know, now I've progressed. I'm here for months. I'm here for a year and I still haven't been engaged with by the community, I feel out, like an outsider. Um, but an example that I have is that the young, at, the young at hearts at church, always when I was whenever I would go to a service, always give me a hug. They always ask how I'm doing. They ask how my brother's doing. Like they just have this like conversational um, skill where they're just like, I know, I remember the things you tell me, how's school, how's work, how's this? And it makes me feel really good that when I leave church, I'm like, I'm really cool with the young at hearts. Like they're my friends, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, shout out to young at hearts. You guys are really cool. Um, <laughs> they'll, love, they'll love that. I think that's the best thing. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because um, when, if you read through this, through their growing young book, they talk about how like tips, tips for us to, you know, fuel better, a warm, more warm community. And they talk about knowing people's names and how that's like number one on the list because it's like low hanging fruit. Um, and yet it's so impactful. Like that's the yeah. simplest thing that we could do that has like the most return, like the most bang for our buck is just to know people's names and then to remember the things they say to you. Like, yeah. yeah. I have been noticing a lot recently with some of my friends who are starting to get married, like that's a big change. And then I think a lot of people have a hard time uh, maintaining their church relationships when that happens. Um, and especially when you start having kids, you know, it's, it just kind of separates you. I think sometimes um, from the rest of the congregation or just your friends in general. So um, there's definitely a lot of people there that I'd love to start, you know, getting to know, but I don't really know how to break that wall. I think like whenever I try to like strategize, well, uh, like that sounds kind of um, cold and calculating, but <laughs> like whenever I try to really think of like, how can I be a better church member? Like, how can I, you know, be the church in the church and like do my part? I, I think about the things that I don't like or like that I don't want to see and then do the opposite um I feel like when I was a youth and oh I'm still a youth but like when I was 18 and going to college and felt really disconnected from church um I it was because I was seeing things I didn't like but instead of doing something about it I just was like well peace out I'm out, you know, and I realize now that that wasn't the best thing to do. So now I'm thinking, okay, maybe I, you know, if I'm seeing something like, you know, I'm not reaching out or I'm not engaging a new person. Well, 
now I'm going to, and now I am going to actually get to know them and make a point to um, remember their name and their family and, you know, X, Y, Z. So I think before I would just, you know, dip and I would just be like, okay, like I'm out, I'm not doing this. But now it's like, okay, I'm going to do my part and literally be the change that I want to see um, to loosely use Gandhi, Gandhi's quote. <laughs> so loosely. I like that. I like that because it's, it's really empowering for like younger generations because I think naturally we put the responsibility on older generations to, to do that hard work, which is I think normal because we have bit better tools as we get older to do that work. But that doesn't mean that a younger person can't do that work and can't reach out and can't do the things or be the things or make the things they want to see in the church. So I think that's actually a really empowering, um, empowering thing to share with us, Grace. Hi, I'm Mick Wakefield and I'm the worship director here at Clayton Community Church. I just want to start today off by thanking you for joining us. Uh, wherever you are, whether you're in the US, where you're, whether you're somewhere else in the world, we want to thank you for taking time out today to spend time with us and to spend time with God. Uh, we're going to dive into the Word of God today and we're just going to really dissect this idea that we've been working through over the last month or so about what it means to be a community that's growing young. Um, we as a church, we as a leadership, we as a community here believe fully that the young people today are not the church of tomorrow. Now you might be ready to jump down my throat but the reason we believe this is because we believe they're the church of today. The young people today have the Holy Spirit exactly the same as Jesus walking on this earth. They have the whole power of God within them to change the world today. Not when they become 18 and adults, not when they finally have a job and a family, but right now, here today, they can change the world. And it's our jobs as leaders and as elders and as some of us elderly, let's be real. Um, it's our job to walk with them, to make sure that we create a world where they can, can be leaders, that we create a world where they feel comfortable to be those leaders and to make a change. So over this last month or so, we've been talking about growing young and some of the aspects of what that means. Some of those things that we've been looking at, we, we did a survey and we surveyed across our church, across different age groups, and some of the things that we believe it takes to grow young as a church, we didn't do too well on. Some of them we did really good on. Uh, the subject I'm talking about today is something that at face value we did well on. But I want to challenge us today to look deeper into it. Um, we're going to be talking about growing young. And in the study of growing young, the title of this is to fuel a warm community. And some of you might be thinking, yes, I'm, I'm warm, I'm welcoming, I shake people's hand when they come into church, pre-COVID of course. Um, I, I have my friend group, I'm in a small group, I go to this event, I go to that event. But I want to challenge us today, because there's many aspects of this idea of fueling a warm, com a warm community that I do believe we do well. We do have a very great welcoming team. We have an amazing ability to make somebody feel welcome when they first enter through the door. But there are many aspects of this idea of fueling a warm community that Fuller Youth Institute emphasised as a need for churches to feel like a family. When, when Fuller Youth Institute talk to young people across many denominations, across many different cultures about what it means to fuel a warm community, one of the words that stood out to them was this word family. It needs to feel like family. Ephesians 2.19 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. That means that we're all part of God's family. We're, we're part of his family and therefore we should be a family. Now, in the US, we view family a certain way. 
When I say the word family, you will get a picture in your mind. And for a lot of us, that picture will look like two parents, a couple of kids, maybe a dog and a couple of cats. See, the problem with this picture that is, I believe that's far too narrow. That's, that's far too narrow for us to model our community on family if that's how we see it. It's a very closed community. It's the it's wrong mindset to have when building a church into a family. This creates, creates the closed community and not a close community. I'm going to say that again. This creates a closed community and not a close community. They're two very different things. See, I remember as a teenager, um, there was a lady in our church and some of the most influential, influential people in my life when I was growing up were not the ones I lived with. They weren't my pastors and they weren't my youth leaders. I'm sorry guys, but the truth is they were people who took time in church. There was this one lady, she was an older person in our church and I always saw her as being real. I always saw uh, her as being somebody who cared because here's this thing, she, she took time to ask how I was and genuinely wanted to listen to my answers. This lady, I'll never forget her. She, she's, she was so influential in me becoming a worship leader and just growing me up into, into who I am. She would always talk to me and she'd ask me how I was feeling. She'd ask me what my week's been like. And then, here's the thing, she would listen. And I knew she listened because she responded. Not with rushing comments to say, oh, that's good or anything, but she asked more questions. She dove into my life. She wanted to get to know me. I didn't, I, I felt like with her, I could share what was really going on because she actually cared. She wanted to know. Here's the thing. I didn't have to pretend that everything was okay. I didn't have to just say, yeah, I'm fine. Because I felt like she cared. I would share my ups and my downs. I, and she would talk to me about her family. She'd talk to me about her kids. She'd talk to me about her work. She'd talk to me about what God's doing in her life. Bearing in mind, I'm 15 at this point, And she's probably in her 50s. Maybe even 60s. So for me, she seemed like such an older person. She seemed like we didn't really have anything in common, but she cared about me. It was wonderful to have somebody who I felt like I could trust and that she trusted me because she'd share with me too. She'd always come to me the next week and then she'd talk to me about the things I'd shared with her the previous week. She'd ask me, how's that coming along? You were saying this is going tough for you. How's that, how's that nowadays? How's that this week? What's changed this week? And she really, really wanted to know. She used to have this phrase, and this phrase, I, I tell people about this nowadays, and it, it became something of a joke, but also something that she was deadly serious about. And anytime I was going through a hard time or some, I, I was doing something I didn't like or I, I, you know, we have to do things we don't like sometimes. Anytime I would come to her and I'd grumble about it or I'd just moan about how bad things were, she'd say, Mick, it's character building. And we had this joke going that she'd just drop that on me all the time. The problem is, if you know me, I'm absolutely full of character already. So for me, I'm like, Listen, Evelyn, I don't need any more character. Please don't say that. I don't need more character building. But here's the thing. That phrase become, it became something personal between me and her. It was something that we had as a 15-year-old and a 50 to 60-year-old. As I look around the world today, I don't believe that the church looks or feels like a family. Now, don't, don't jump down my throat. Don't attack me right now because I'm going to talk about why I don't believe this. I don't believe that we are creating a warm community and a family feel, and here's why. Fuller Youth Institute talks about two things 
that help fuel that feeling of family, that feeling of warmth. These two things are interconnectedness and mutuality. Interconnectedness is really knowing the people around you, being connected with them, knowing what makes them tick, what floats their boat, what keeps them up at night, what really excites them. It means being there when they need you and being okay with the silence when they need you to stop talking. Now mutuality means that I bring all that I am to the table, but you do the same too. It means that diversity is golden. It means that that diversity, we don't just accept it, but we celebrate our differences. And we understand that it's okay that we don't agree on everything. It means that you and I can be ourselves without fear of judgment or having to conform to what the other pe person thinks or believes. Now, I believe that in the world today, division is spreading like a plague. We, we look at the news right now and all we hear about is COVID and we see how COVID is really, really changing the world that we live in. But one thing I see more on the news around the world, not just in America, is this division that is spreading. And it's destroying families and it's destroying friendships and it's destroying the church. Let's be real. I believe that the need to be right trumps the need to care for one another, the need to love one another, the need to get over it and be with each other. I believe that interconnectedness and mutuality are nice ideas, but not really the reality of the world today, and especially not the reality of the church. Be honest, we've just had the elections in the US they're still ongoing. Nobody knows really what's going on. It's kind of crazy. But how many of you have gotten angry with somebody that you know fairly well? Written something or spoken that anger out or simply just written somebody off because they don't stand on the same political line as you? Be honest with yourself. How many of you have had that moment this week alone? Galatians 3, 28 and 29 in the message says, In Christ's family there can be no division into Jew and non-Jew, slave and free, male and female. How about we add some things in there? Black or white, Republican or Democrat, rich or poor. There's no division. It says, in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jew non, non, or non-Jew, slave or free, male or female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendant, heirs, according to the covenant, covenant prom promises. I love this in the, minute, in, in, the, in, in the middle of those verses where it says, this is, we are all in common relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what community is, right? It's a common unity, right? It, it's taking something that we all have in, com, in common and bringing us together. I believe the challenge to us today is to claim this victory over division and start creating a world where love is the beginning, the middle and the end game. Not that we start with love and then we get things mixed up in the, end, in the middle and we might get back to love in the end. No, we need to start with love, keep love in the middle and end with love. Here are some ways that we can begin in this creating of that world. All of them start with you. Here's the thing. None of this will happen if we just have another program, another awesome worship set, another small group, or even an amazing youth leader. 
This begins with just you. To big, begin building interconnectedness, here's the thing. We have to start with mutuality. And I say this because without mutuality, there's going to be no connection. In mutuality, you bring your whole self to the table. And so do I. Young, need, young people need to see the real you. They need to see the struggles you go through and your failures just as much as they need to see your wins and your bright days. They need to see your ups and your downs. They need to feel like you trust them with all of you before they'll trust you with all of them. Growing Young talks about how young people are yearning for authenticity. I say we're really all yearning for your authenticity. None of us want the fake. None of us want the pretend. We all want the real thing. So what does that mean? That means we all have to be authentic, right? Colossians 3.12 says in the message translation, So chosen by God... For this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. See, we all have to wear compassion, kindness, humility, patience. But above all, we have to wear love. When we put these garments on, we will be authentic. We will be real. Because there's no way you can wear all those garments and not be real. Relationships require this realness. They, requ they require authenticity. It's time to take off masks. See what I did there? Little COVID joke for you. But seriously, it's time to take down those walls. Stop pretending everything's okay. Then we can work on the interconnectedness. This actually takes us out of our comfort zone. And it takes intentionality. Now we've got mutuality, we, we can step into the actions of being interconnected. We did a, a little bit of this a couple of weeks ago at, at our worship night. I called out all the young people and I called out all the people over the age of 30. I asked them to come forward and I asked all of the people over the age of 30 to go Find a young person and ask them their names. Then take it to the next level. Here's the thing. It's cool to get to know somebody's name. It's cool to ask them which school they go to. But take it to the next level. They had to promise to pray for that person for the next two weeks. Now, I don't know how many people actually did that. But I do know that this last week I got a call from a lady in my church. I got a call from a lady who happened to talk to my daughter on that night. And she said she'd been praying for my daughter each and every day. But this morning she, she had been given this idea from God. So she wanted to share it with me. And she wanted to share it with my daughter. See now... To my daughter, that showed that there was someone else who cares for her. Someone else who's willing to invest time in her. Get to know what's going on in her life. The big things, the little things. And then go away and pray about her. Then follow up with that and share what God had spoken to her. So here's the thing. Take some time. Look around the church. The challenge to you today is to look at your community and take these simple steps. They really are simple. 
First of all, make a list of all the people you can think of in your community, in your church, who you can reach out to across different generations and all the differences that might be in front of you. Allow yourself to spend some time looking at these questions. Who could I drop a text to? Who could I invite for a meal? Who could I take out for a coffee? Who could I jump on their Instagram and just drop them a quick encouragement? Who can you be more in intentional to connect with? Who have you always thought might be so much fun to hang out with? Who lives a total different reality to you? Ponder some of these questions and then actually act on them. Here's the thing, interconnectedness starts with an action. It doesn't just happen, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. It's not going to be something that just comes quickly. It's going to take action. It's going to start with mutuality. First of all, you being real. It's going to take you getting out of your comfort zone. And then here's the thing. Extend an invitation. It's really cool to go through that first list and think about all these people. But it doesn't matter if you don't invite, if you don't reach out. Now, this doesn't have to be weird. Uh, just think about it. If, if you ask yourself the question in number one about who's a young person that I can reach out to, invite for a coffee or for a meal, it doesn't have to be weird. Invite their family over to your family's house for dinner. Don't make it weird. Reach out to the family. Ask the family to go out for a walk. Go out for a day out somewhere. Let the invitation be natural. Don't make it forced. This is not be about creating another program or another thing to do. This is about building relationships. Then number three, commit to fostering this warmth. Create, commit to creating this warm community. Interconnectedness is not going to happen overnight. You may extend an invite and get a, nah. Don't stop inviting. You may have to play phone tag for a while. There may be cancellations. Remember, this is about building relationship. It takes time. It takes effort. And all of this shows that you care. And then here's the thing. Through this time, through this time of building, you're going to get down. You're going to feel like it's not working. But celebrate the process. This whole year, God has been speaking to me about the process. And I've been talking a lot about the process. How we are so busy with the minutiae of daily life, we often miss the joy of the process. So celebrate the small things. Celebrate the process of building community. The first time someone actually responds to your invitation or your encouragement. Celebrate that. The first time someone is vulnerable with you and they share something that is important to them. Celebrate that. You are not going to be best friends overnight. You may never be best friends. But warm community isn't about best friends. Family isn't about best friends. It's about knowing that there's somewhere you can always go when you need somebody. There's always going to be somebody with open arms for you. So celebrate when you realise that you know something about that person. When you know their favourite drink or their favourite dessert. Take a moment to celebrate the process and enjoy it. Let's go and create a world where young people want to be part of our church. Let's go and create a place where it feels like family. Where you can actually get connected and feel like you belong. 
That's what we all want, right? We all want to belong to something. We all want to belong to somebody. We all want to be surrounded by people and love. Let's start building that today. I'm so glad we could take communion together because you see, communion is about belonging. It's about being part of a warm community. It's about being part of God's family. You see, communion reminds us that Jesus Christ gave his life for us so that we could be a part of his family, so that we would know that we belong. And so I want you just to stop this right now, get a piece of bread, get some juice if you got it, or something that reminds you of Jesus' sacrifice, his body and his blood given for you. You got that now? Let's just take communion together. Let's be the family of God. Let's be the community of faith. Because you see, on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and after breaking it, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As long as you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So taste and see that the Lord is good. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these elements that remind us that you gave your very life for us. Your body, your blood, all reminders of your sacrifice so that we could be a part of your family so that we can have a home where we belong. Thank you, Lord, for including us in your family. Let this be our place of belonging in your arms. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to me.